to another anthropology lecture, lecture 11. Um, this time we're going to take a look at something that's kind of not fun to talk about, um, but it's important for the development of states and the development of political organization. Um, we're going to be talking about bureaucracy. The idea of having people in charge of specific jobs in order to make a state function efficiently will have to be developed in Egypt. So we're going to take a look at how that development occurs, what kind of jobs there were available, um, and how they all tied into the functioning of the Egyptian state. But first, we need to do some theory. Our theory is going to be on the theory of bureaucracy in general. And this is a chance for me to introduce to you one of the biggest names in the social sciences. A man named Max Weber. Weber was a 19th century sociologist. Pictured here. Um, and a lot of his social theory is important to uh, what historians and anthropologists and um, sociologists do today because he worked on what would it take to develop a bureaucracy, uh, a functioning administrative state. Uh, and he also worked on what the features of that would be. So first of all, you need a bureaucracy when there's a large and dense population. And certainly Egypt by the time of the Old Kingdom could be classified as that. Um, with enough people to do the work needed to keep the Pharaoh um, held to the standard of a god that he was and to make sure that in death um, he would be um, he would be uh, appropriately sent off into the afterworld to join the imperishable stars with the other gods. So you need people to make that happen. So bureaucracies develop when there's enough people for um, a state to organize itself administratively. Um, complex administrative tasks. It's very easy when the state is small and all you have to worry about is we get food um, we try not to kill each other, and maybe occasionally we decide if we're going to go to war against our neighbors. But the more you start adding administrative tasks to your state, tasks about defense, about getting um, specialized kinds of goods, pottery and uh, wine from other places around the world, the making of wonderfully decorated um, cosmetic tools and palettes. All of these specialized tasks require uh, someone to sort of oversee it and bring it together, especially since these things are going to be done for the king of kings, the pharaoh, uh, the, the god on earth, the Horus in the flesh. So we've got to make sure that a state can produce what it needs to produce um, so that this God King um, can rule in splendor according to his majesty. Um, Weber said that there needed to be a money economy. And here's where the, the theory kind of falls apart for Egypt um, because there isn't a money economy yet. Um, there won't be a money economy for quite some time. Um, but there's really no need for one because you don't get market exchanges in ancient Egypt governed by a sense of, I will pay you $2 or whatever an Egyptian equivalent that would have been um, for, you know, these chicken eggs or whatever. Um, no chicken eggs though. Let's say, let's say duck eggs. That would be more appropriate and accurate. Um, and because the economy revolves around the person of the Pharaoh exchange, really isn't about making money. Um, it's about producing goods 
for the elites, producing goods for the king, um, and you don't need a money economy for that. So uh, this is where Weber's theory kind of breaks down um, because we don't need a money economy and yet ancient Egypt does have a bureaucratic state. Weber went on to describe what the features of the bureaucracy would be, um, said that's definitely hierarchy and we do see that in Egypt. There's a clear sense of who's who, what the title is, um, what your job is, uh, who's above who, who's below who. Jobs with fixed roles. Um, this is a little messy in ancient Egypt, um, but there are certainly clear indications of people with titles and apparently things to do with that particular title. So there is uh, an expectation that you have a job and this is the job, uh, how it's supposed to go. Written rules. Um, we do get a sense of that a little bit later. One of the Egyptian um, offices that we're going to talk about um, does have a set of expectations that go along with it um, that get written down later and show up as the duties of this particular office. Um, remember, writing is, is existing in Egypt and um, it is uh, has its origins in being able to track goods that are going to go for the king's burial um, and to track the materials needed for the elites. So we have all these ivory labels that were apparently affixed to goods to tell us where they came from and what's in it. So writing does exist, um, but you couldn't say necessarily that there's a full-fledged manual you know, there's no just sort of giant book you can pull out and go, yep, yeah, this is it. Here are all the rules. You are going to be the chief um, hairdresser for the king. Here you go. Here's your manual. Um, expertise. Um, Weber said that in bureaucracies, there's a sense in which the jobs themselves develop uh a focus on this is the way to do this and you need some knowledge in order to do it. You just can't just wake up one morning, walk into the job and go, yeah, I'll figure this out. Um, there are, in the case of ancient Egypt, there are rituals, there are things to say, there are ways to behave, there are utterances and recitations, um, religious and political. Um, there's definitely a way things are done. Not that that can't change, but people certainly do um, show some evidence of, you know, expertise in the titles. Um, it just can't be made up on the spot. It's got to be done the right way. Now, um, Weber might not apply quite exactly to ancient Egypt because Weber was thinking in terms of like a modern rational state, um, a state where people are driven by reason and law and order. But you have to remember the Egyptian state is driven by order, ma'at, um, but that's religious in nature. And everything in the state is for the person of the king. So, this is not a state that is rational in the sense of non-religious. It's not a secular state. So we often use the term patrimonial to describe these kinds of states. Um, they do have bureaucracy, but everything is funneled through the person who rules. Power therefore flows directly from the leader. You serve at the pleasure of the leader. You owe loyalty to the leader. Um, and you see all kinds of evidence for this around the world where there are monarchies or where there are fascist kinds of states. Um, even in our own country, uh, President Trump has been uh, accused of being this kind of a leader. Um, you can see evidence of this in um, lots of different monarchies around the world. Uh, where everything comes from the person in charge. 
There's no separation of private and public. So there's a mixing of what is private, um, what is public. And in very many cases, public is it's everything because it's all the person of the king, the person of the monarch. So there's no implied right to privacy because at some point, anything could come under the, the notice and view of the king. And then finally, these states do tend to be patriarchal. So driven by men, uh, patriarchy, even the word patrimonial, the P-A-T-R is from the Latin pater for father. Um, so the, the rule in these states tends to be very male dominated, which is certainly going to be the case in Egypt. Not to say, though, that we can't have queens who rule and queens who rule as pharaohs. Um, so we'll get to that and um, talk about some of those roles a little bit later. So you can see how even a patrimonial state um, could still have elements of bureaucracy, because if the leader wants something, you're going to have to have a system of organization to get it done. And you're going to have to have roles and say, Bob, this is what you do. Fred, this is what you do. Um, writing will be necessary in that to manage. Um, and there'll be some complexity there. So that's some of the theory of the background for um, state development. Let's actually look at some of the jobs um, and functions of the king's state, um, the state that was Egypt. So let's talk a little bit about the origins of Egyptian administration. And um, for that, we need to go to the King Joser pictured here. Um, Djoser um, was king during uh, a massive building program that resulted in a new kind of tomb for the king of Egypt. He built, well, not he himself literally, uh, but he caused to be built a pyramid that is called the Step Pyramid. And that should invite us to think about why you would need a greater organization and administration for your state. Um, in early Egypt, digging a hole in the ground and lining it with mud bricks, okay, takes some labor, not highly organized. Um, it's pretty easy to do. You do, of course, need to fill it with supplies. Um, but as the Egyptian kings build increasingly larger and more impressive um, burial spaces, the state has to organize in order to sustain and build those royal monuments. Um, and here's the, the, catcher, uh, the catch for all of this. Once you build a pyramid, you're not done. The person of the king needs to be sustained by a mortuary cult that will stay on after his death um, to feed and to provide uh, support and worship for his spirit. Um, and of course, that's going to be the same for all of these um, noble folks as well who are part of the king's household. So if you're going to be moving massive amounts of supplies, building huge buildings, keeping a staff together to uh, support the king's cult after he dies, you're going to need an organization to make that happen. And that's administration's role in um, ancient Egypt. Most of the officials of the Egyptian administration were royal kin, so these are sons um, and other relatives of the king. Um, it kind of makes sense. you got a household full of people. What are you going to do? You're like, well, I'm going to put my brother in charge of this and my son in charge of that. Um, so it kind of makes sense. The king did have royal lands, domains, and estates, which Egyptologists will tell you there's some Differences between those, but we're not going to concern ourselves with that. Sorry, Toby Wilkinson. Um, 
These royal lands produced the supplies needed for Pharaoh in life, but also Pharaoh in death. And therefore you need workers, you need people to oversee them, you need to be able to count and uh, process all the produce that is kept for that. Um, and that requires an administration in order to make that happen. And that leads us to another point that we have to consider. You need labor. It's not just enough to have like stones and building blocks and mud bricks. Who's going to do that work? In ancient Egypt, they had a system um, of labor that uh, we call corvée labor. Um, it's going to sound a lot like slavery, um, but it's not slavery. Um, even though you are laboring kind of for free, but you really aren't. All of the common folk of Egypt had to provide labor. It was their duty, their service to provide labor to the king. And it was really kind of based in the reciprocity that we talked about in an earlier lecture. You know, the king upholds order, ma'at, upholds justice, upholds the rightness of the universe as Horus in the flesh. And you, ordinary person, you owe this Horus on the throne, you owe his majesty work because as a God on earth, you know, he's out there fighting the forces of chaos. He's making sure everything's running. Um, so you owe that labor. It's your religious duty. It's your sacred duty to do this. So you are not being um, forced to labor against your will, even though you may not want to go work. Um, an individual may be like, eh, I'm not interested in that. Um, you are doing this out of a sense of duty to this leader who um, is a god on earth. And of course, they, you do get taken care of. We have lots of evidence of the uh, villages that were created to sustain these workforces to make sure that they had the food and supplies needed to be able to labor to build these giant pyramids. Um, and then finally, you're going to see a lot of titles for all the people surrounding the king. Um, just wait till we get to the end of this lecture and the assignment I'm going to give you where you're going to see a lot of these titles and you go, what? So lots and lots of titles for these people um, and things to give them jobs of what to do. And on the next slide, we're going to look at the most important title of them all. Most key title of ancient Egypt um, is the vizier. Um, the vizier is the king's second in command, um, the sort of prime minister of Egypt, as you will, overseeing everything in the name of the king. Um, we see this title appear by the second dynasty. Menka is the first uh, vizier. There are probably elements of that having existed before. There's some speculation that on the Narmer palette, a figure there represents the vizier. Um, it makes sense. You would need someone that the king could say, hey, get this done. And that person would see that it gets done by telling other people, hey, you get this done in the name of the king. Um, the title in Egyptian for vizier is Jati. Jati is um, a word that means he of the curtain. Um, in hieroglyphs, it's very interesting. It's a little baby duckling. Um, and we have a person here at the end to tell us that this word is referring to a human being. Um, so he of the curtain um, is the one responsible for basically making sure that everything happens. You kind of need, if you got the one at the top, you need the second in command. And that's what the vizier does. Over here pictured is Vizier Hemiunu, um, who was the, the builder of Khufu's pyramid, um, or I guess designer, not builder literally, because people, ordinary people built that. Um, he was a grandson of the pharaoh, the king um, Sneferu. He did hold several titles, because that's pretty common. Um, king's son of his body, and you'll see a lot of titles where the title is spelled out in relation to the king. 
um, chief justice, vizier, greatest of the five of the house of Thoth. Um, so it's not uncommon for a person to hold more than one title. It's one thing to have jobs and specific occupations for people in your bureaucracy, but you have to also consider as a state, how will you divide territory? We're used to this. Um, we live in the state of Ohio, um, in the county of Franklin. Um, we are a suburb of the city of Columbus, so we are in Bexley, and that increasingly smaller units of geographical organization, that's a part of developing states. Um, what's the smallest unit of territory that you can organize and put under the control of a person? In ancient Egypt, we call these gnomes. Um, these are just easily administered districts of Egypt or divisions. The word gnome just essentially means district. Um, that is uh, the word gnome in hieroglyphs, um, sepat. And uh, you've got here, this is actually this, what looks like railroad tracks. These, this is a sign that marks irrigation. Uh, so presumably these gnomes were uh, areas that you could put under one centralized irrigation system. They were small enough to be under that kind of um, organizational scheme. Um, by the third dynasty is when we start to see these clearly being laid out, though they surely existed before, but more on an informal basis um, as the state was getting organized. By the uh, later periods of Egyptian history, there will be 42 of them, and each will be ruled by a nomarch. So literally, arche, the Greek word for rule, ruler of a gnome. That's all that nomarch means. And then pictured here on the side is a nomarch. This is Idu II, nomarch under Pepi II. Look at his little hairdo. He's got a squat little chest, too. Interesting. I just wanted to show you a map of uh, Lower Egypt, or the northern part of Egypt, and so the gnomes that are here. Um, in Ibu Hedge, uh, the white walls, that's the gnome um, right here. Uh, we've mentioned before, there's a four-leg gnome, uh, the west gnome, the southern shield gnome, the mountain bull gnome, the western harpoon gnome, uh, black ox. Lots of animal references here, which shouldn't really surprise you about early Egypt, um, that animals feature pretty strongly. Uh, when you've got a country that's organized around a river, um, dividing this up and splitting these little territories off um, would be an easy way of keeping track um, since you can get to everything by water. So it makes a lot of sense. So I borrowed this uh, diagram from a very well-known Egyptologist and expert on early uh, dynastic history in Egypt. I really like it. I think it shows pretty well what the Egyptian state has to do. Um, you've got the king, the king's immediate royal family, um, the vizier in charge of all these branches of government, um, things that are needed to make the royal household function, because the king's got to eat, the king's got to travel, the king's got to be maintained, cleaned, washed, fed, bathed. Um, we are, you know, dealing with ceremonies that the king does, um, travel that the king does, uh, making sure that everything that's needed for um, the pharaoh is there. You've got to take in lots and lots of resources. you got to account for them. You got to be able to redistribute them where they need to go because we are, you know, conscripting using corvée labor to get these workers to build this pyramid, and so we got to feed them. So you got to redistribute. Um, you got to have the military and got to have them fed and taken care of. You have regional and local government, so places that are close to, say, Nubia in the south, you've got to be able to have somebody in charge of that. There'll be forts built down there. Um, there'll be territories that are conquered and they need to be controlled. You've got the gnomes, 
you'll even have towns and town mayors um, uh, because Egypt does have urban areas in it. So this all is a map to represent just how complex the ancient Egyptian state was and how that had to develop. So in our last slide, I promised I would let you see some titles. You do not need to write these down. I'm just going to use this to introduce your homework. Um, so here's some titles from the Old Kingdom. Administrator of the Desert. That sounds fun. Captain of the Royal Bark. Royal Seal Bearer. Confidant of the King. Controller of the Tent. Think about what do they mean? Which are economic? Which are concerned with getting supplies? Which are concerned with the King's person? You know, Controller of the Tent. I know that doesn't sound very glamorous, but the king travels. And so you can't just like pick up a mud brick palace and take it with you. You know, got to have somebody who is making sure the king's royal ship is safe and provisioned and ready to go. This state requires a lot of people to function. And so in your homework, um, based on this, you're going to be looking at tombs. Uh, from elite tombs from Saqqara and a few from Giza and look at the titles of the people in those tombs and try to think about what those titles say about the ancient Egyptian state. So this has been our look at bureaucracy in ancient Egypt and I'll see you next time.